Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Pan Future Podcast. I'm your host, Sean, and today is Saturday, December 9th, 2017. On the show this week, I've got uh, another older essay of mine that I'm going to share with you, and I think it will give you more insight into uh, a career uh, area that has been upended by technology already. But before that, let's get to the news of the moment. The first item in the news this week, uh, scientists have developed a living organism that incorporates both natural and artificial DNA and is capable of creating entirely new synthetic proteins. Uh, this is coming from the journal Nature and comes from uh, Floyd Rumsberg, a chemical biologist at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, California who added uh, DNA to some E. coli bacteria. Uh, Normally, DNA is made up of uh, components adenine, uh, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, uh, A, C, G, and T. He also added two letters that they have called X and Y. Now, with this uh, addition, the E. coli has been able to make new types of protein. It has incorporated these synthetic DNA components into uh, the DNA process of making proteins that do different things. Uh, One of their goals with this is to develop proteins to deliver uh, drugs to treat illnesses. Um, Normally, the kidneys will clear out those proteins uh, and the drugs in your system pretty quickly. With uh, an artificial setup like this, they hope to be able to attach fat molecules to the drugs and keep them in the body longer. Uh, Now, there are, of course, some people who have great concerns over this type of uh, synthetic life. However, in this case... Those fears should be unfounded um, because these cells cannot make their own X and Y uh, DNA components without uh, addition of certain chemicals in the lab. So in other words, they can't get out, they can't get into the wild and continue making more of themselves with these synthetic uh, DNA components. Um I do think this is kind of another example of science headlines gone a little bit wrong because I guess it's a step, uh, most of the headlines say, you know, it's a step toward creating artificial life. Kinda, I guess. It's, I mean, I guess it is a step out of, you know, 10 steps, 50 steps, 10,000 steps that it'll take to do something like that. Um, I don't know. It's more significant to uh, somehow the headline should have been, you know, synthetic DNA used to create new proteins, you know, but that's not as eye-catching as artificial life. So um, you've probably seen this headline. Take it with a grain of salt. Ultimately, that's not, I, I don't think that's even really the goal here to make a fully artificial life. Um but it is just fascinating research, and it's interesting. I don't have the Nature article in front of me. I have basically summaries from Reuters News. Um, I would like to see more details about this, about how uh, what the X and Y molecules are made out of and how the organism incorporates them into use. Um because it's it seems like they just stuck some things in there and they worked. Hey, look at that! I'm sure it wasn't that easy. Um, but keep your eyes open. This is another uh, very cool medical and biological advance. And now it came from outer space. space, space, space. Well, not from outer space exactly, but scientists are studying uh, simulations of Martian soil. Um, researchers at a Dutch university. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name of the lead researcher or the university. Uh, 
please go to the links for the show and read this because I want to give all credit where credit is due, but uh, I don't want to butcher these names horribly either. Um, but NASA has concocted a soil that simulates uh, the soil on Mars, and these researchers have been able to uh, breed worms in the soil. And two small worms were recently born in a colony living in soil, as the article says here. That seems remarkably small, uh, two worms, but uh, this indicates that these worms can adapt to the conditions of the soil on Mars. The Martian soil is very poor, um, very sterile, doesn't have all the stuff in it that worms normally like, or any life normally likes. Um, and in this case, uh, this is important because worms could play a crucial role in uh, future Martian colonies. Uh, worms take uh, dead organic matter from the surface and eat it, and then when they expel it out, the bacteria breaks it down further. And they are an important component in maintaining the nutrition level uh, in the soil for plants to grow. So showing that worms can adapt to this condition, to some pretty harsh conditions, uh, and then as time goes on, they will help condition this soil for growing plants. Um, that is just really cool. However, there is one big hurdle to overcome still. Uh, Martian soil has a lot of, uh, of a chemical compound called perchlorates. Uh, perchlorates uh, are used on Earth in certain industrial applications, but they're also extremely hazardous to life, and pretty much nothing uh, other than microbes uh, can survive in this stuff. These researchers exposed their worms to perchlorates, and almost all of them died. Uh, so removing the perchlorates from Martian soil before you put worms in it and try to grow plants is very important. But uh, small steps, like all, like all science, like all research, uh, one step at a time moves everything forward. Um, maybe a year from now, we'll read about how they figured out how to uh, remove the perchlorates very easily from the soil. And that's your news of the moment. On to the uh, main segment for this week, I want to share with you another older essay of mine. This one offers more thoughts on a career in the creative arts, how the field continues to change, and what it means to find meaning in what you do. I also have a few thoughts on the desire to leave a long-term legacy. Even though I speak from the perspective of being a musician, it would be valuable to everyone to apply these thoughts to your own lives. Technology has made a music career what it is today, and all the warnings you hear about automation taking over your job or upending your industry have already happened to musicians. Automation and artificial intelligence could change every job, and I'm not convinced capitalism is sustainable. If money no longer moves the world, how will you move yourself? From August 2014, free music and I'm just trying to stay alive. I've released a new album of miscellaneous songs, sorts of tunes I wrote for films that don't exist, songs I thought would be good for video games, that sort of thing. I like the music and it's nice for it to see the light of day. I also wanted to collect some of these things so I could clean out the attic, clear room in my brain for new music I'm working on. I have uh, been working on a new acoustic album, but these songs kept giving me the sad puppy eyes, so they go first. This new album is available as a free download. CDs do cost money to buy, but they also cost money to make and ship as well. Which brings me to a waypoint in a part of my musical journey I started about 15 years ago when I first put music online. Think about that. I'm 38 right now. <clears throat> Back in 2014. There are kids now learning to drive who've never not had downloadable music. And for much of that time, that music has been free one way or other. 
I've struggled over these 15 years with how I feel about free music, stolen or legit. I want people to hear my music, but it would at least be nice for this endeavor to partly fund itself. So I have finally settled on a decision, at least for my own music. All of my music is now available for free download. It almost always has been, but at least if you're going to get it for free, get it directly from me. If you have purchased my music in the past, thank you. Every bit has helped me continue doing what I do. If you haven't, but you would like to, you could donate when you download from Bandcamp, or contact me directly at my website. This is also now the modus operandi for Strangeland, my band, so you can get all the prog metal we've made for free, too. That really all is all there is to say on the surface. If you want the music and no more, you can stop reading now, or listening. Uh, if you want the whole story, read on. There's a joke I see posted about musicians quite often. Musician. Person who loads $5,000 worth of gear into a $500 car for a $50 gig, or something like that. Only, it isn't a joke. It's the truth. The only untrue part of that joke is the $50 gig. I'd be thrilled with 50. It's usually more like 10. The creative sphere is an ecosystem. A thriving, healthy ecosystem is diverse, like the rainforest or a coral reef. There is great variety and stability for the long run. One that isn't healthy lacks diversity and could collapse suddenly. There are some cases where some life thrives in hostile environments, such as the extremophiles that live near the ocean vents. But even there, the balance is precarious and the diversity is dwarfed by what you would find in the rainforest. If the creative ecosystem is damaged, creativity suffers. We have movie sequel after reboot after sequel. You have top 40 songs that all sound the same. In my opinion, there are many unsigned bands and niche markets that also all sound the same. Uh, because the only way to survive at all is to be like someone who already did it. But that always lessens the diversity of the group, and pretty soon you're all the same. If the support isn't there, creatives will be less likely to take risks. Less risk means less growth. Most regular gigging musicians do three-hour shows, three 45-minute sets. In order to make even the equivalent of $8 per hour for a wage, those gigs would have to pay $21 an hour, assuming the musician can gig five days a week. That used to happen, really, when the musician's union mattered. To get it in one gig, it's over $100 an hour. Add travel time, gear cost, and the hundreds if not thousands of hours of rehearsal, and it's beyond impossible to actually make a living gigging like this. And even book gigs every weekend all year long is a monumental task. Okay, sell merch. Well, a CD costs between $1 and $3 to make, Last time I had t-shirts made, they were about four bucks each. Unless you can sell 50 CDs and shirts at every single gig, you're still struggling. Honestly, this decision to make my music free makes me feel like I lost. I failed. I did something wrong. And it's hard to make sense of feeling like you failed at being yourself, expressing yourself. But at this point, I don't know if another approach to take with my music. I'm not a schmoozer. I'm not a people person. I don't like selling myself. I don't have tons of money to pay someone else to sell me for me. I don't like playing shows very often. I never have. That's where you would sell merch, maybe make tips. Live shows have usually been for me at best a semi-fun distraction, at worst a total waste of time. I have been lucky enough to open for some bigger bands and performers, and those shows are always good, but they are also few and far between. I am an introvert, and I much prefer the mad scientist approach. I want to tinker away in my lab with my experiments hidden away from the world, releasing music when I can. But that's not good enough for the world anymore. Just being creative, enjoying the process, doesn't cut it. Doing something other people can't doesn't matter. And by can't, I mean make my music. Mine isn't any better than anyone else's, 
but I am the only one who can make my music. It is a reflection and extension of myself. You have to be large and loud and do something stupid and put it on YouTube. I can't stop making music, but some days I can't think of a good reason to keep going. This isn't just about my music or any one type of music. You can be the poppiest, catchiest, prettiest performer ever, but without a lot of luck and or a lot of money behind you, your chances are slim. For every Macklemore, a uh, little side note here, Macklemore is apparently a performer who is very successful just selling tapes out of his trunk uh, after shows, worked very hard, good for him. Um, that was a few years ago. Anyway, continuing on, for every Macklemore, there are a thousand artists you'll never hear of. Endless hard work is always necessary, but today that will only go so far. And it's less and less likely that hard work will ever make you a decent living in music. Reverb Nation is a very popular site for bands to use for promotion. There are over 500,000 bands listed on their global chart ranking. Certainly some of those bands are defunct, and some might be cover bands. Uh, Wikipedia states that Reverb Nation has 3 million band accounts with 30 million unique visitors a month. Whichever number is right, that is either a monthly average of 60 page views or 10 page views per band. And you can bet the spread isn't even. How do you compete? Before the internet, an unsigned band was at best a small fish in a big pond, just trying not to get eaten by the few big fish. Now we're all small fish, but the pond has become an ocean, and there are millions of fish. Entertainment has changed. Video games and Netflix binges are the kings. People don't go out like they used to. Who was the last band that broke because they were big in their hometown and spread by word of mouth? Macklemore? Who else? Bueller? Bueller? And does anyone really get huge anymore, like Michael Jackson huge? Now, how many artists that make it big uh, make it for more than two or three albums? Uh, what band that had a big hit in the last five years will still be making albums 20 years from now? Spotify and Pandora are getting to be the most popular ways uh, to listen to music, and they pay fractions of a penny on song plays. People will say that Pandora and Torrent sites are exposure. Well, I can die from exposure. Sure, the music is out there, but for every 100 people who download a random new band, how many become fans? One, if you're really lucky. Again, you're overwhelmed with choice. More of us artists are more visible than at any time in history, cutting smaller and smaller pieces of the pie. It used to be almost impossible to get your foot in the door. Now we've all come through the door and we're stacked like cordwood. How much more music can one person consume anyway? And between CDs and downloads, I probably have 1,200 albums in my music collection, I bet in any given year, I listen to less than a hundred of them, and at least half of those will be albums I've been listening to for years. I don't want to compete. I want to create. That's the artist conundrum. I do this for myself. I have to satisfy myself and not care what anyone thinks. I know I'm not making a commercial product, and yet at some point, I want to share. At that point, I have to be ready that... Nobody else will get it. Nobody else will like it. Nobody else will care that I've done this thing. And that was a major factor that tipped the decision to make my music free. If I really am doing this for myself, I cannot expect anything in return at all. I've told myself that's how I feel for a while, but I haven't really lived it. Thus, now I will create and share and generally ignore the rest of you. Or something like that. As I said at the beginning, if you want my music for free, get it from me via Bandcamp. I would still say don't use torrent and file host sites. Uh, Kim.com, founder of Mega Upload, has made millions of dollars mostly from advertising, but musicians still get nothing. The industry still uses and abuses musicians. Any torrent site you go to will, will be making some money, but at this point the creators of content that allow sites like that to exist get squat. 
Torrent sites are now the new big labels that chew up and spit out creators. And wherever you do end up getting my music, if you like it, please consider a donation. It really does help. Let's get into the nuts and bolts. I spend several thousand dollars a year making my music. Probably an average of two to three thousand dollars, sometimes more, sometimes less. Getting new gear, repairs, manufacturing CDs, shipping, web, hosting costs, continuing education, advertising promotions, it all adds up. Not a huge pile of money, but a chunk. And I'm in the boat of trying to make a living from music. I don't have some great banker slash engineer slash whatever day job that allows me to afford an expensive hobby. And this is not a hobby to me. I am self-employed, so at any, any time off for music is time not getting paid by a day job. What you're doing when you pay for my music is helping me continue, and it's a positive feedback loop. The more I can make my music, the less other work I have to do to survive. And then I have more time to make music, and you get more music more often. Music is an inseparable part of me. I love creating. I love sculpting in sound. This is not a hobby. This is a job I love, and that I mostly don't get paid to do. Quitting music for me would be like dyeing my skin blue, cutting my arms off, changing my name to Apple Fritter Jones, and running off to join a Catholic convent. There is no universe in which any of that makes any sense at all. I don't have children, and I never will. The closest thing I have in human form are students, and I hope I've left them with a good influence. The music I create is my family, my legacy. It's all I'm going to leave behind, and a hundred years from now, if anyone thinks on me, they will be listening to my music. And that's your show for this week. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, thank you for listening to that uh, essay that's just a few years old now. Um, I don't bring these to you so you can listen to me whine. Uh, that is not my intention. Um, take a moment to think of your own career, your own job, whatever you do, and imagine that it's been oversaturated with people uh, doing the same thing. Maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you've struggled to get a job as a teacher because there's too many other people looking for the same job wherever you live. Or even if you're just uh, uh, doing something labor-y, like working in a factory or a warehouse, and you need that job because you need to have a place to live and food to eat, but there's too many other people looking for the same thing. Uh, and, and all those jobs, think about how technology is impacting that and will continue to impact that. And really consider in the long term, 10, 20, 50 years from now, is the way we do things, is our system, is our capitalist system sustainable? If there comes a day when robots do most of the jobs what are the rest of us going to do um are we going to find a way to survive so that all of us can do the creative things that we want to do whether it's music or gardening or carpentry or woodworking or just you know spending time with your family if you can do all those things without having to worry about needing money to survive, that would be so much better. I'd be perfectly happy continuing to do music for free forever if I knew I'd always have a place to live and food to eat. But that's not the way our world works right now. And my biggest concern is that we're not going to figure this out before it's a crisis, that 
the, the way in which we reduce the number of people looking for jobs and competing with the robots is going to be some sort of crisis where we have riots and lots of people die in their wars, and then what's left over is rich people with robots. I don't want to see that happen. So think about how you can change those things now. Think about how you get your entertainment. Think about how you pay for things. You know, I don't, Sometimes shopping local is a good thing. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Um, but when you're, I guess I, I'm just rambling now because these words are hard to form. If you think that $10 is too much for a CD or throwing a few bucks in a tip jar is m not money well spent, well, it is, it is. Um, because... Playing guitar in front of people for an hour looks like easy money. But there were thousands of hours that led up to that moment that nobody saw. Um, there's always more behind the product than, than you realize. Not everything is disposable. This, um, th uh, this is a core concept of Alvin Toffler's Future Shock, written over 40 years ago. We're so used to everything being disposable and cheap and plentiful that when something is presented to us that took a lot of time and a lot of work, we just dismiss it based on the price. Uh, my my wife is, a, is an artist, and she's sculpted some things by hand that I think, you know, a few hundred dollars would be a fair price. But except for the few people who might uh, collect, see something they really love and have a lot of money and want to buy things just to own that thing. Uh, you know, people don't even give it a second look. Even if they might have that money, they, they don't think about, um, they kind of look at the price tag first and say, eh, I can go buy a tchotchke at Walmart for $2 and I'd be just as happy. And I guess if that's your thing, that's your thing. But, Whenever you encounter people being creative in the world, um, keep in mind that there was a lot more work that went into that than you can see. I guess that's the final thought on my rant and whining and all that stuff. So once again, um, thank you, thank you, thank you for sticking with me for this show. I really do appreciate it. Do go to the website, panfuture.org. Uh, I'll have a few links there for the news bits today and to my original blog post here. And I will talk to you again in the future.
expected that you would drag your feet.